Hello everyone, it's The Diplomat coming to you from the USA and we are on part 13 of the Chris Watts Discovery read-through. Welcome back. Uh, we just finished with some pictures that were sent from the babysitter of Celeste in the crib and now we are on a supplemental report from Officer Perez on Discovery page 240. Uh, written on September 2nd at 2058. On August 16th, 2018, at approximately 2041 hours, I arrived at the McDonald's to see if they had the surveillance video ready. I spoke with a different manager than before, and she advised she did not know anything about surveillance video being requested. The manager advised the supervisor is the only person with access to the surveillance video system, and they would not be back until later in the week. I asked the manager if she would pass down the information on the video surveillance that was needed, and she agreed. On August 17th, I received a voicemail from the McDonald's supervisor advising he needed more information on what camera angles are the ones that were needed. On August 19th, I asked uh, Officer Dole if he would go to the McDonald's to speak with the supervisor and inform him of the dates and times that were needed from the surveillance footage. Officer Dole advised me the supervisor uploaded as much surveillance footage that would fit in the flash drive but did not have enough memory and needed additional flash drives. Officer Dole advised me he dropped off additional flash drives at the McDonald's. Officer Dole placed the one flash drive that contained the, f contain that contained the footage in my mailbox. August tw on August 24th, at approximately 20.38 hours, I arrived at the McDonald's and spoke with the manager. I asked the manager if she knew if the other flash drives were ready. The manager advised she was not sure what I was talking about and called her supervisor on the phone. The supervisor advised he did not know what camera angle footage were the ones that needed to be in the flash drive. The supervisor advised the cameras they have pointed outside do not record any footage. I advised the supervisor that I would advise him if the inside camera footage would be needed. On August 30th, I asked Detec Detective Baumover if, the needed, if he needed any surveillance video from inside of the McDonald's. Detective Baumover advised me to get video of all day August 13th. I went to the McDonald's again and spoke with the manager. The manager contacted her supervisor and he advised me the video on August 13th. 2018 was already deleted because it was not saved. I will attempt to contact the security surveillance system to see if they're able somehow re to retrieve that video footage. The one flash drive that had video was submitted into evidence. That's a lot of work there for, I guess, nothing. I hope he at least got a free burger out of that. But if they do have any footage from these things, I certainly haven't seen any of it up on YouTube. Um, not sure if it's worth watching any, even if we did have it, but we may never know. Page 241, Supplemental Report, Officer Dave Baumover, September 4th at 937, has information on Shanann. Uh, the usual type of personal information of Bella and Celeste and Chris's information. The following information was documented at the time it was gathered. The date of this report is not indicative of when the investigation occurred. On August 13th, at approximately 1340 hours, Officer Coonrod was dispatched to 2825 Saratoga Trail on a check well-being call. The reporting party, Nicole, called about her friend, Shanann. Nicole stated she dropped Shanann off at a residence located at 2825 around 0148 hours, or 148 a.m., after returning from a business trip that took place in Arizona. Nicole stated Shanann was 15 weeks pregnant and was not feeling well during the trip. Later that morning, August 13th, Nicole became concerned because Shanann was not answering her phone calls or text messages, and also missed her doctor's appointment that was scheduled for 10 a.m. Nicole went to Shanann's residence located at 
2025, and discovered her car in the garage with car seats positioned inside of it. Note, Shanann and her husband, Chris, Christopher Watts, herein referred to as Watts, have two daughters who are three and four years old. Nicole attempted to enter the front door, but a latch prevented it from opening more than three inches. Nicole called Watts and requested he come home to check on Shanann as she believed Shanann may be suffering or passed out due to some medical conditions. The call CAD notes are as follows. This is an excerpt. I guess this is what um, when the police uh, dispatch information, someone's uh, taking notes about it. Concerned about her friend, 15 weeks pregnant, she wasn't feeling well. She's having issues with her husband as well, not responding to text messages or phone calls. Shanann Watts, uh, date of birth, late 20s, early 30s, it says. Uh, okay. Um, RP, that's reporting person, that, that would be um, Nicole, dropped her off at her house at 2 a.m. this morning. Her vehicle, white Lexus, is parked in the garage, not answering the door either. She also had a doctor appointment today that she did not show up for. Her husband's name is Chris Watts, told RP. Shanann took other two kids on a play date. RP doesn't believe this because her vehicle and car seats are still at the house. It's interesting when you read that here. So 1341. At 141 in the afternoon case was cracked boom right there RP doesn't believe this because her vehicle and car seats are still at the house you know the beginning here were facts <coughs> excuse me but that was kind of that first step towards Hey, Chris, what'd you say? Continuing. Upon arrival, Officer Coonrod checked all windows and doors, including the rear slider door, and discovered all of them were locked with no way into the house located at 2825. Officer Coonrod contacted Watts and requested the code for outside garage door keypad, who stated it didn't work, but that he was only five minutes away. When Watts arrived, Officer Coonrod entered the home, with Watts' consent, in an attempt to locate Shanann and their two children, but discovered they were not in the home. When questioned by Officer Coonrod, Watts said Shanann arrived home from her trip around 2 a.m. Watts said he woke up around 5 and began talking to Shanann about marital separation and informed her he wanted to initiate the separation. Watts stated it was a civil conversation and they were not arguing, but were emotional. Watts stated around 527 hours he backed his truck up to the garage door to load up tools and left for work and that Shanann was in bed when he left. Note, a neighbor's video surveillance system recorded this event. Watts said Shanann told him she was going to a friend's house later that day with her, their two children but didn't know the friend's name. Watts, who works for Anna Darko, said he went to a job site near Hudson to check on it. At Officer Coonrod's request, I responded to the scene and arrived at approximately 14.35 hours. Upon arrival, I was briefed by Officer Coonrod and also learned Shanann's personal effects, including her cell phone, purse, and wallet, and medication were located in the house. Upon entering the residence, I observed Shanann's purse on a kitchen island and a suitcase located at the bottom of the stairs leading to upstairs bedrooms. A pair of women's shoes was located near the front door. Upstairs, I observed the bed in the master bedroom had been stripped of its bedding, which was lying on the floor. Officer Coonrod and I both checked the bedding for signs of foul play, but found nothing. In a loft area located between the bedrooms was Shanann's cell phone that I later learned was found between two cushions of a sofa located in the loft area. On scene, I asked Watts to walk me through the period of time when he lost, last saw Shanann. Watts said Shanann arrived home from the airport at approximately 0148 hours. Watts explained he knew it was 0148 hours because a doorbell camera sent an alert to his phone. At approximately 0400 hours, he informed Shanann he wanted to initiate a marital separation and they were both upset and crying. 
Watts said Shanann told him she was going to a friend's house that day, but Watts did not know which friend, friend he was, she was referring to. It should be noted that when I asked Watts a second time to recall his day, he told me he worked out in his basement for 15 minutes that morning before returning to the bedroom to speak with Shanann about the marital separation. Did he? I mean, I'm not, I don't really lift, so, I mean, would working out help him perform this crime better? I don't know. If, if you, anyone has any thoughts around that, let me know. Watts said they, he and Shanann, were having financial troubles and planned on selling their house and getting something smaller. I asked if they were planning on residing together during the separation. Watts said he would get an apartment somewhere and Shanann and the girls could move into a smaller house and they would share custody of their kids. Watts showed me an email via his cell phone from a realtor to prove the intention to sell their home. Watts said at approximately 527 hours he'd be he backed his work truck into the driveway to load up tools, which he estimated took 10 minutes, and shortly thereafter drove off to a work site near Hudson. We know it, we all know it took longer than 10 minutes. Neighbor Nate home video surveillance shows Nicole shows Nicole's vehicle leaving at 148. At 527 a.m., Watts' truck is observed backed into the driveway and leaving a short time later. The surveillance videos is only motion activated clips which appeared to have a delayed recording response. Using Trinastix, Xfinity, login, and password, I was able to observe Watts' work truck parked in his driveway for about 37 minutes and leaving at approximately 5.45. A legal request to Xfinity for the full length of video is pending. So he said 10 minutes. It was closer to 40. Watts also showed me an alarm. I'm sorry, I just had a thought. If he said it was only 10 minutes, and it turned out to be 40, I mean, he would know how that he was in that driveway for quite some time. If, if he was trying to tell the story of it being only 10 minutes... Does that mean he didn't really remember the camera was there? I mean, he would know, he would know he would be on camera for almost, you know, closer to an hour. Um, and he's telling them only 10 minutes. Interesting. Watts also showed me an alarm notification alerting him the garage door was left open at 5.27 a.m. Watts said he received the same type of alert for the basement door earlier that morning and appeared to be puzzled by both the alerts. I asked, if, I asked Watts if he closed the garage door when he left for work at 5.27 as he reported. Watts said he thought he did. I asked Watts if he had received any other garage door alerts after that. He said he had not. And what I've read anyway is the garage door being the garage door to the inside of the house. But you'll see at some point we'll get to testimony where he says that he looked back when he was driving away and saw the garage door closed. So he's talking about, in that case, he's talking about the outside one. So, to me, it's still confusing about which garage. I know the Vivin system alerts um, on the garage door, pro uh, inside garage door, probably more often because it's direct entry into your house, uh, whereas the outside garage door is not. But I do believe you can have it on the outside as well. Um, so, that was that's still an, an interesting part. Knowing Watts was employed by Anna Darko, I asked him where he went after leaving his residence. Watts said he went to an oil well site near Hudson but was not able uh, to provide me the well site name. I asked Watts if anyone could vouch his arrival at the oil well site. 
He said no one else was at the site until later and that he went there early to check on a repair before starting his normal duties. Watts provided me names of co-workers, Cody and Troy, and of his supervisor, Luke. I asked Watts again for the oil well site name, but he couldn't recall it, citing it wasn't a normal site for him to check on. There's no way he couldn't recall that. I mean, that site had to be burned into his brain at that point, right? Um... When I spoke with Nicole, she reiterated much of the information I had learned from Officer Coonrod upon my arrival. Nicole added she was certain Shanann went inside the house because she backed her car up to get a better view of the front door and watched her walk in. Nicole also said there was no way Shanann and the girls could have left the house other than through the garage due to the doors being locked. Nicole said Watts typically does not back up his truck to the garage or leave through the garage in the morning. Nicole explained how Shanann would become upset with him because the noise of the garage door opening would wake the girls. Nicole was adamant Shanann would not leave the house without her phone or medications or take the girls anywhere without their car seats. Nicole was unsure if Shanann may have had any other medications, same prescriptions in the house that she could have taken it taken if she left. Watts provided consent to check Shanann's phone and ultimately surrendered it uh, to allow me to examine it for information leading to Shanann and daughter's whereabouts. Subsequently, I transported the phone to the Frederick Police Department and began reviewing her apps in an attempt to locate any recent messaging purchase receipts, etc. While at the Frederick Police Department, I spoke with Officer James, night shift, shift parole, patrol, about the call. I informed Officer James I had Shanann's cell phone and was searching it for information about Shanann's habits, friends, and to see if she had any recent email or messaging traffic. At the end of my shift, I transferred the custody of Shanann's cell phone to Officer James to continue the search and contact friends. Refer to his report for more information. A neighborhood canvas was conducted for several hours later that evening by patrol officers and a check well-being Bola was initiated through dispatch. An additional search consensual of the Watts residence was conducted by Sergeant Bakes, Officer James, and Officer Coonrod. Refer to their individual reports for more information. Nothing further for this report. So I, I tend to believe that the latch on the front of the door was a mistake, and maybe it was, um, you know, Chris just trying to keep people out. You know, it was just kind of a natural thing for him to put that latch on. Um, but it made it obvious that they couldn't have left through the front door. So page 245, we have some handwritten notes. Um, it's, it's, this is also Balmover. Uh, this is, uh, illegible here, but talking with Shanann, someone talking with Shanann, um, another note was, uh, was going to friend's house today um, with kids maybe something 0530 to work it's Chris Anna Darko site East Hudson Luke Cody Troy uh, thrive sales at house talking about what Shanann does and four and three year old girls uh, page 246 we have supplemental from officer James we have Addie's name, Cindy, Christina, these are the friends, so we'll start a little bit of that. On September 4th, at the request of Detective Balmover, I contacted the following individuals that I spoke with on 813 to request the correct spelling of their names, address, and date of birth. I spoke with Addie, and her address, you know, redacted stuff. I spoke to Addie after I had originally left her a voicemail requesting her call me back f for me to obtain the information. I spoke with Christina. Uh, Christina advised her husband, Deloy, has an alternate phone number. Okay. I spoke with Cindy. Cindy ad advised she would cooperate in the case but was reluctant to provide me with her address because she did not want her physical address published on the court document. Cindy advised her name was released with the affidavit and a witness list. Cindy said she had no problem giving it but was afraid of it being on a public document. Cindy advised after the second affidavit came out, she probably had five times more phone calls including in the middle of the night. 
Cindy said they had her phone number somehow and said, like media, stuff like that. The information was relayed to Detective Baumover. I left a message for Sam and Jeremy. At the time of this report, I had not heard back from either party. Video footage uploaded to evidence.com. We have uh, handwritten notes from James on 248. 9 4 Addie, Christina, Sam, Jeremy, Cindy, their names. Addie, Sam, left messages. Christina, oh, just a bunch of names. Jeremy left a me voice message. Cindy, reluctant to provide address. And Addie. Then supplemental from Baumover on September 5th, 718. The supplemental report was generated for the purpose of booking evidence uh, collected at the autopsies of Shanann Bell, Bella, and Celeste Watts conducted at McKee Medical Center. Nothing further. And that's where we're going to stop for this part uh, at 249. And we will uh, resume um, on 250 with uh, some evidence. So I just did that there on purpose just because there's, you know, I think some of this, a few of these pages up here can be a little bit more difficult to read some of the things. So, um, you know, I'll just give that a, a advance warning. And again, in the next part, uh, I'll try to do that during certain parts. Um, as I continue to, to, you know, plan ahead and, uh, just so you are prepared if there's certain things that are much more difficult to read and we know there will be, I'll try to give you advance warning so that you can choose to skip, um, you know, to whatever, uh, part you want. So thank you as always for listening. I uh, hope you have a great day.